to email us, Dave Meltzer at EYA.com. Anyway, we have got Edge on the line. We want to get to him. How are you doing today? Not bad, not bad at all. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Um, this is the first time we've had you on the show, and um, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that uh, I had heard about, about you um, is the uh, very beginning. You have a real interesting introduction into pro wrestling as far as that the contest and everything. Uh, could you kind of yeah. tell everyone about, a little bit about the background of your, 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 begin, your beginnings in wrestling? Sure. I mean, it was one of those things, uh, as, a, as a child, I gravitated to it. I was always into things like Kiss and comic books. So when I saw wrestling for the first time, it was like real-life superheroes. So uh, it just seemed like a natural for me. I, I kept watching. I was nine years old saying I wanted to do it. Um, but I was 17 and still saying it when I saw a contest in the Toronto Star that said, if you ever want to be a wrestler, write in an essay to uh, the column. And the, the free prize was uh, training at Sully's Gym in Toronto. So they called me up, Sully's did, once I'd uh, entered it and said it's down to you and a few other guys. We want you to come down and see who we're going to choose to train. So they chose me, and that was the beginning of it. And uh, how, long, how long did you train, and how long was it before you had your first match? Well, let's see. I started training when I was 17. I trained for a year. I had a, a little battle royal that I don't actually count, um, and that was on June 1st. 92, um, but I, I mean, I was wearing track pants and running shoes at that point and been in the gym for about two months. So I kept training for a year. Exactly one year later, um, I had my first match, uh, which I consider my first match. It was a, a handicap match. It was myself and uh, guy by, or actually it was a tag team match, myself and El Fuego against Joey Legend and Zach Wilde, and that happened in Monarch Park in Toronto on, uh, on June 1st of 93. Now, and uh, the rest is history so far. Now, explain your path in, in getting to the World Wrestling Federation, because, um, I mean, I remember you with the, I guess, Sexton Hardcastle. And, and, and I guess I should ask you, where did that name come from? <laughs> it's a, a, friend, a friend of mine who's uh, he's pretty creative, and uh, he actually had, he writes books and comic books and everything like that. He, he always uh, would come up with characters as we were growing up when we were bored in French class, and uh, one of his characters was Sexton Hardcastle. And uh, we, we just decided that if I ever uh, started doing this, uh, that I would use that name. It was cool with him, and uh, I just thought it was hilarious. So, and it incites it, the kind of reaction that I wanted, and I could go out and act like an idiot and dance around, which is kind of a little bit of what we're doing right now. Where did what did the thing about the flash photography? Who came up with that? Um, that was one of our writers, Brian. Um, he came up with an idea um, where basically we just, you know, we've won the titles and everything goes to our head, and we just think that everyone wants to take pictures of us because of it. Uh, we don't come through the crowd because, of, well, it's just gotten out of hand, things like that. Um, so, you know, we'll sit down, the three of us, and uh, a lot of times now Kurt and uh, the four of us will just sit down and just brainstorm ideas for each city. And we try not to get pigeonholed by doing, you know, the teams thing too much because then when you go back to that same city, what are you going to do? Um, so we're always trying to come up with different things. Between the three or four of us, we, we usually come up with uh, some different things. Now, with the, with the Jay Riso Christian, um, yeah. you guys go back. How, how, how far do you guys go back? Because I remember, I remember, like, independent Christian Cage and Sexton Hardcastle, you know, going yeah. back many years. Yeah, well, we, uh, we actually met in grade six. And um, it was a funny story. We, uh, he, he was a new kid in school. I went to Princess Elizabeth Public School. He was the new kid, kid, and he had a ninja star, and that made him, like, the coolest kid. So uh, we hooked up and started throwing his ninja star into trees, and that's how it all started. <laughs> so, so you and him are, the, are actually the same age? Uh, yeah, both 26. I'm actually exactly one month older than him. And uh, we just, you know, watch wrestling. We were, were diehards. And, um, you know, we'd wrestle, not that I'm condoning this, but we'd wrestle in his side yard and jump off of washing machines onto mattresses and things like that. That's why uh, I think we get along so well with the Hardys because they, they were doing the same thing on a trampoline in their backyard in North Carolina while we were doing it in Canada. Now, um, now, now, how old were you when you, um, when you, when you guys first started watching wrestling? Did you start very young? Like, or... Uh... Yeah, I was pretty young. I was like eight or nine, um, which I guess isn't all that young. But up until that point, I, like I said, I was consumed with Spider-Man and, and Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. So, uh, you know, from there, it was just, uh, you know, when I saw wrestling the first time, it kind of took their their place. 
Now, what, um, there's, there's something I've always kind of wondered about, um, and that is something I noticed about a, a, a kind of a slight difference, and this is probably so, so slightly stereotypical, okay, but, but still a difference between um, the Canadian wrestlers and the American wrestlers in that the Canadian wrestlers, generally speaking, and I've often attributed to, to the difference between Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan and the Canadian wrestlers that, that have come in tend to be better technical wrestlers and more uh, fans of the work rate aspect, whereas a lot of the American wrestlers that come in are kind of fans of, and not, not, and this, was, this is overly stereotypical, but, but on a higher percentage of the American wrestlers that come in are kind of like... Uh, you know the bodybuilders, and that not, they're not really. Let's put it this way: not as much into the work rate. That, that may have changed in recent years, but for like the generation that you came up with, that you know, yeah. that, like in that period. I mean, well, do you, do you I think. think I, sorry to interrupt, but I think you know, per capita, there's so many more wrestlers that come from the states as opposed to Canada, and uh, I think that's why you you still get your core of wrestlers from the states that are good technical wrestlers and everything, but. With such a vast range of guys coming in, you're always going to have your your posers, your bodybuilders that aren't aren't real concerned about the work rate. I think what a lot of uh, the Canadian wrestlers uh, with our work rate has to do with Stampede Wrestling, um, and I think that's really influenced a lot of of well, it influenced me. I grew up uh, watching Chris Benoit, Owen Hart, Brian Tillman, you know, Bret Hart, Dynamite Kid, guys like that who. You know, enough said. They, their work rate is is top notch. Um, I know that's what Christian and I watched. We also watched WWF, but because of watching Stampede, the guys I watched were Ricky Steamboat and uh, Randy Savage and and you know Dynamite and Brett when they got there. Um, you know, and I think also a lot of us, as you can probably see, were highly influenced by Shawn Michaels because coming coming up at that time, as you're wanting to get into the business, he was the man, um, and and probably arguably the best ever. So um, I, I think in between Stampede and Michaels, he, he's probably influenced a lot of the Canadian guys the most. Um, but it does seem like with, with the, the small handful, I guess not that small, but the handful of guys that come from Canada, it seems like the work rate's pretty high. I, I think that's a, it's a good compliment. Yeah. Now, now you um, – okay, so you started out in, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um at that point, I mean, were you were you someone who came in there and once you started out, it's like this is this is how I'm going to make my living and I'm going to make it and I'm going to go because you you went you traveled a lot more than most independent guys at that time period did. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's to get noticed or just to just to get matches or, or I'm not sure, but I just I just saw your name around in a lot of places. Well, it was a little bit of both. We do it to uh, get noticed and get experience. Um, it uh, you know we we went wherever we could. Um, one tour it, we called the tour from hell. We went down to uh, Tennessee for a month, and Christian was told, Jay was told that we had 18 bookings. It ended up being three. We wrestled in a barn in Fall Branch, Tennessee, in front of six people, um, and you know just got got dates where we could, and it was just uh, one of those things because we knew what we wanted and we knew in order to get it we had to do this um i always said to myself that i never had a doubt that i would make it not to sound egotistical or cocky but i think if you have that doubt then you won't um i sat down i had a conversation with a friend of mine when we were both you know trying to break in and he said he didn't have that same confidence and to this to this point he hasn't been hired and i think that has a, a lot to do with it you need to have that confidence in yourself in order for someone like vince mcmahon to have that confidence to put you on tv now, how 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 was uh, working with uh, Dory Funk Jr. Because I guess I oh, worked with him a lot before starting with the WWF. Yeah, at the uh, the first Funking Dojo, um, Dory was the trainer, and uh, a year before actually, I had sent Dory a tape. Um, I was in two teams at the time. I was teaming with uh, Jay a lot, and I was teaming with Joe as uh, Second Violence. And I had heard they needed teams for a tournament in all Japan, so I thought, well, why not? I, I sent Dory a tape, and um, he uh, he said he liked it. So we, we had talked uh, on and off that year, and then I found out that he was going to be the trainer of that first camp. And so I was really looking forward to it, and it, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, I look back on all the people that I've learned from, and I, I was trained by Ron Hutchison and Sweet Daddy Siki. And then from there, I worked with Brett a little bit out in Calgary, and then from there, Dory Funk. So, I mean, the list of guys who helped me get to where I am is a, is a really good list, and I look back, and I'm thankful for it. This first question here is from Ryan Anderson, who says, uh, how, what would you rate as your best singles match and your best tag team match so far in the WWF? 
Oh, yikes. Um, hmm, best singles match. I had a few with Jeff Jarrett that I really enjoyed. Uh, I think a fully loaded pay-per-view where I dropped the uh, the IC title to him was fun. Um, I've had some with Elo that I've enjoyed. Uh, yikes. I don't know, some with Jeff Hardy I've enjoyed. Hey, it's tough to really just narrow down one. Um, tag team I can kind of narrow down just because of so many of them since I've been there. We had one against uh, Val Venus and D'Lo uh, that was on Sunday Night Heat. Um, that I re- that I really enjoyed, and I think you know the one that everyone always wants to mention, um, which is probably my favorite, is the tag team ladder match at uh, No Mercy. Yeah, and that's the one that that everyone remembers. I think you know if yeah. you have to pick one match of Edge and Christian, that's the one that everyone that pops into everyone's mind. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's start hitting the phone calls. We'll go to Masad in Pennsylvania. You're first up with Edge. Hi guys. Hey uh, Dave, Edge, and Brian. How are you? Fine. Hey. Good. How you um, doing? I'll ask Dave a question first. Or uh, one of you guys, did you notice uh, Jim Ross making the comment? Pat Patterson came out on Monday. He said, uh, "Here comes Pat Patterson," uh, and he went to uh, Tony Awards with uh, Lisa Lane, who I guess is supposed to be uh, homosexual. What did? He, what, what exactly did he say? He said um, Pat Patterson just went to the Tony Awards with uh, oh. with Nathan Lane. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I forget who, but I, I actually remember the comment, and I didn't even know the person who was saying it about, but I figured that's I kind of, you know, you know you know what the Pat Patterson jokes always are, so, you know. Yeah, but is, is there any legitimate heat between those two guys, or is it just, like, uh, kind of ribbing? I, it's, I think it's more ribbing only because um, every commentator uh, that the WF has had, with the exception of when Vince, because Vince always played straight man, Always made you know Pat Patterson jokes. I mean, you can go back to Jesse Ventura and all of them. It was just a, it was kind of like the, an inside rib type of thing. I don't, I mean, I don't know that there's not heat, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's just it's just one of those things. It's it's I think it's part of WF culture is uh, that the commentators make fun of Patterson uh, in that in those situations. And the guy doesn't mind Patterson. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know him well enough to know if he minds or not. I mean, it's just something that's always been done. I don't know. I don't know. If, if, what Howard Finkel used to think when they used to always kind of use him as the butt of jokes either, it's just something that they do, you know? Um, I don't. I, I really don't know the answer as to if he minds or not, though. After the broom spot, I don't think he could. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, question, Asad? Yeah, my question for Edge was, uh, has, has WWF ever talked to you about a singles uh, singles push without without the tech team? Um, well, I mean, it's been thrown around uh, off and on all the time, um, but things change uh, minute to minute um, with the the, cult, the current uh, state of playing. Uh, you, you always have to keep people interested. When that happens, everything changes a lot. So there's been times where, uh, you know, a single push is coming and then it just ends up being a tag team thing again, which is fine by me. Um, I, I've kind of looked at it like the way Brett and Sean had their careers. And if I could uh, try and forge the same thing, I think that would be a really cool thing. They didn't, they weren't rushed into anything. They weren't pushed into anything. It just happened. And uh, I'd, I'd like to think maybe that's the same path I'm on. Your, your last uh, Owen Hart's last match was with, with, was with you, right? Yeah, yeah, in uh, Chicago. It was uh, Chris and myself against uh, Owen and Jeff at the uh, Rosemont Horizon. Oh wow! Was it the night before the pay per view or the week before? Yeah, yeah, it was the night before. Wow, I didn't even know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Anything about that massage, or just wanted to ask him if that was the truth? That yeah, was the case. just wanted to know if that was the truth. Okay, I'll hang yeah. up now. All right, bye bye. Okay, thanks yeah. a bunch. Okay, let's go to Kevin in Seattle. Kevin, you're next up. Hey, Dave. Hi, Brad. How are you doing? Hey. Doing good. Hey, uh, Edge, first of all, I want to say, uh, as a fellow Torontonian, that uh, you're Uh-oh. my favorite wrestler. And uh, uh, thank you. congratulations on uh, everything that you've achieved so far in the WWF. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I saw your match at, uh, I was at WrestleMania, and uh, I'm going to say the triple threat uh, ladder match stole the show. Uh, other than that, I just want to ask, um, what happened to the angle between you and Val Venus, and was that supposed to be a work or shoot angle between uh, uh, you and uh, your wife or Val Venus's uh, sister? Um, it was one of those things. It was basically the beginning of a start of an angle. Um, we had uh, that match for the European title, but in that match against me, Val sprained his neck. 
um, and that put him on the shelf. He tried to come back two weeks later, but, you know, like I was telling him, it takes at least a month of doing absolutely nothing to heal a sprained neck. So to hop back in the ring, I mean, it just wasn't a good idea, and it wasn't because I put him on the shelf for about another month. Um, at that point, it, things totally changed. Um, Christian and I went off and started, you know, going into this thing with the Dudleys, and at that point it had such good momentum. Uh, with the whole triangle thing that was building up to mania that it wasn't a good idea to stop it, um, to go back into something that had happened, you know, almost two months prior. So, uh, that, that's why that got shelved and now we've kind of just gone our own separate paths and are doing our own thing. And, uh, I'm engaged to, to Val's sister, so it, uh, it seemed like a natural. Are you ever opposed to having her, uh, being part of WWF angles or part of a TV or uh, anything like that? Um, yes and no. I think if it were to happen, I'd rather it be Atlanta just because I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that with someone else. But at the same time, I wouldn't want her, you know, exposed to, to what we go through night in and night out because it's hectic and it takes a toll. Um, and uh, it, maybe if it were short, you know, if it were just for the one storyline, but then you see how popular some of the girls become and, and you wonder if it would actually be that way. So, I don't know. It's a uh, double-sided coin, I guess. Mm, okay. Well, i got one more question for I was wondering, you uh, obviously you, Christian, Chris, uh, Jericho, and uh, Chris Van Wall are, uh, I guess you would say, on the, uh, on the bottom level of the top tier right now, working your way up. Who do you see in the next – group of people uh, coming up to the uh, the main event status, so to say. Let's see. Well, I, I would have to throw Kurt Angle in that group. Um, Kurt's one of the, those guys. He's only been wrestling uh, all together for, I think, about a year. And to me, he seems like a natural. Um, he's really picking it up. And from teaming with us, he's like a sponge. Not that we're teachers or anything, but we have more experience. And uh, he definitely listens, which is good. And he already has natural instincts on, on knowing what to do, having to be told. Um, so I would say Kurt. I would say uh, Chris Jericho. I would say Chris Benoit. Um, I'd like to think we are. I don't know. It's it's always hard for a tag team to, to crack that, that top tier. Um, you know, so it may be one of those things where we have to uh, break up and, and do a program against each other for us to be able to crack into that. But, uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> well, I, certainly, um, I, I see you guys as being in that top tier already, and uh, uh, I just want to say continued success in WWF, and um, good luck with everything else. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Edge. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, um, are you, are you living in Toronto, or did you um, move from Toronto? Actually moved from Toronto. Right now I'm in Toronto, though. Um, I'm in my truck in Toronto. But uh, we moved out of the Bahamas, and that was uh, strictly because of the, the taxes here in Canada. When you when you fall in the uh, highest tax bracket, the tax are 48 percent. So that that just seemed like a lot to me, and I decided, well, you know, Lynn and I will move down there and give it a shot. So I moved down for a year, and we've decided that it's not for us, and we're going to be moving again. So it, uh, you know, it, it was worth a shot. We can say we lived on Paradise Island for a year. Are you going to move to the United States, or are you going to move? For, are you going to go back to Toronto? I'm uh, going to move to the States. Uh, I'm going to buy a house in Tampa, uh, and eventually I definitely want to buy another house in Toronto because it is home, and uh, both of our families are all still up here. Uh, so that, that'll that be where I, uh, you know, come to in the summers. But during the winters, I'm thinking Florida is a lot better. Have you, have you like, uh, before you went to the, to the WWF, was there ever, like, a situation where – I mean, did you you had contact with say you know whether it be WCW or ECW or someone along the way, um, and you you was was it something where you always wanted to get in with the WWF or was there? Well, you had actually mentioned you were considering all and all you know try to get into all Japan at one point. I mean, how did how did your pre WWF career? Uh, who did you meet and not meet and and were there any like near misses? I guess. Um, actually, no. <laughs> Believe it or not, the, I mean, the one place I always wanted to go was WWF because that's what we watched in Canada. We we actually didn't get NWA at all. There was one show called Pro Wrestling Plus that showed little capsules of everything, so I'd see 30 seconds of Ric Flair. So to me, that was all foreign territory, so I was always geared toward WWF. Um, believe me, if the opportunity had to come, I would have gone to either ECW or WCW. Um, but, you know, wrestling where we did, everyone was in the same boat as us. There was never really any, 
you know, names on the show that are, were there or were still there kind of thing. Um, there were always, you know, journeymen at that point. You know, we'd do shows, guys like Butch Reed and Greg Valentine, but they had already spent their time there and were done. So um, it, an opportunity never really came. Um, the first opportunity was the one I jumped on. And, 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 how, and what was that like? Who did you meet and, and who found you? It was actually, uh, I was wrestling an independent show, uh, in Ajax, Ontario, and, uh, a fellow by the name of Carl DeMarco, who's now the Canadian president, was in the crowd that day. He was friends with Brett, and, uh, said, you know, you got something there, uh, I'll give a tape to Brett. And, uh, eventually Carl ended up getting the Canadian presidency job, like I mentioned. Um, when Brett went down with a knee injury, well, even before that, uh, Carl called me one day and said they needed to work some, uh, Bob Hawley in, uh, Cops Coliseum. Would I like to do it? And I said, you better believe I would. So I drove down to Hamilton. I worked Bob, and uh, I was really happy with the match, and so were the agents. At that time, I was 22, so we kept in contact, and that was that. Finally, Brett went down with his knee injury. Um, Carl said I should head out there. I went out. I talked to Brett. I went out there. Um, I had a penny in my pocket, and uh, Brett said, we got to get you signed. So uh, that, that, was, that was the start of my WWF career. What were your feelings as far as the Bret Hart departure? Being um, it was one of the guys who got you in. Yeah, it was really strange because my first uh, dark match was the day after. Oh, wow. Uh, Brett, yeah, so it, wow. it was, I had no clue what to think. I was just, you know, uh, I, I had no clue if that would affect me or what would happen. Um, and it didn't, but, uh, and it was the place I always wanted to go. And, and you know, I think uh, it, was, it was a really strange time. And, um so I, it was one of those things. You, at that point, I was just sitting there and you know saying hi when spoken to. Other than that, I'd just go off in a corner and do my own thing, um, be respectful to everyone, and, and that was pretty much it. Uh, so I just tried to be quiet <laughs> and roll with been, everything. That must have been a real weird uh, dressing room that one day because I mean I I just remember that that 24 hour period after after the Montreal match and just. You know, just talking to several people in the company and things like that on with with, with various viewpoints, um, all kinds of different viewpoints on what happened. But it was just a, uh, it was like a weird powder keg that didn't explode. It almost seemed like. I mean, certain times there were some very vehement people uh, that night that you know eventually everyone simmered down and the company yeah. actually went through the roof afterwards. But it was that that one day must have been very. Very unique first day, I guess, in the dressing room. Well, yeah, it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty uh, strange first day, but at the same time, no one knew who I was, so they wouldn't convey their feelings to me. Um, so I, I just kind of, uh, I was on the fringes that day and just, you know, went about my thing, and I think uh, that day I worked Glenn Culkin in a dark match, and then the next day I worked uh, Jay in a dark match in Cornwall. So, um, and then from there just went back and sat around and waited. <laughs> waited for them to come up with something. So I was at home for the majority of the aftermath besides those two days. Uh, so I didn't get a full, full, get the full aspect of it. But, uh, I mean, I was there, and it was it was different. When, okay, so now with Jay, now did you guys basically, uh, were you were you brought in together, or did you get in first and help him along, or, or how did that all, you know, kind of break I, down? I, I had actually, uh, I was already signed and gotten the first uh, invite to the first uh, Funking Dojo. At that point, uh, Jay wasn't signed or anything. Um, so we went to Japan a couple of times. We came back and did the first camp. And uh, finally, when my character started rolling a little bit, I said, you know, I have this partner. If you're doing more camps, uh, you know, maybe you'd like to take a look at him. Finally, they said, yeah, okay. And uh, so, I mean, I've always said if I, don't, if I open the door a crack, he kicked it open for himself um, and went down and, and did a camp, and they were impressed, and he was signed from there and brought in as my uh, my little brother. Uh, let's let's go to uh, Derek in New Jersey. Derek, you're next up with Edge. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Too much. Uh, Edge, this is I've been thinking about this. What was better, winning the tag titles at WrestleMania or winning the IC title in Canada? Um, I have to be honest with you. Uh, I think the IC because it was the belt that I always uh, really watched. Those were the matches I really watched growing up. Um, I mean, Steamboat Savage, uh, Kurt Hennig, uh, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. They all kind of uh, that 
that was their springboard to the uh, bus to do it in front of all my family, all my friends in a building that I went to WrestleMania 6 at. That was a pretty special feeling. Um, that, I mean, that was still my, my favorite night in this business for me. Um, you know, I still get goosebumps when I think about it. But at the same time, Jay and I always, Christian and I always said that one day we'd win those tag team titles standing there in a side yard wrestling. So they were both real special, and to do it at a WrestleMania was even cooler. Um, so it's real close, but I, I think i got to go with the IC title is my hometown. Who came up with the idea of winning of you winning the title at a house show? Um <laughs> pretty pretty strange story. It uh it was supposed to be uh Jeff Jarrett and Ken Shamrock. Um and Ken got stuck in Detroit. I had wrestled in the opening match with uh Christian against the Acolytes. I got back and I said, Well you're probably gonna have to wrestle Jeff because I was wrestling him the next day. They said it'd be a non title match and uh that we'd do a deal where I went went over but it wasn't uh, you know, title match so therefore there was you know, the title wouldn't change hands. They uh as we were in the ring, I was holding the belt up, gave it back to referee Earl Hudner, and uh, Jack Lanza came out and said, what are you guys doing in the pay-per-view tomorrow? And uh, Jeff said, "I'm." he was going over. So he said, ah, go get your belt, champ. And I went, what? <laughs> and there's actually a tape of it that I have at home, and you can hear me saying, what? Are you, are you serious? Went in, grabbed the belt, and that was that. So yeah. that would that would mean yeah it was it was it blew my mind. So that would result in the shoot comment you said on Slam Wrestling. I, I'm sorry, I, I missed that part. When you when you were interviewed by Slam Wrestling, you said it was yeah. a complete shoot. Well, it was something you didn't. I guess you didn't know about it ahead of time. <laughs> no, no, I, I had no clue. I was completely shocked, and there was a there was a picture in the uh, Toronto Sun the next day where I'm in like disbelief because I was. And uh, <laughs> but it was fun, you know. And none of my family expected it or anything, so everyone was just as shocked as I was. They thought I was holding out on them, but I wasn't. Wow. That, yeah, that, that, pretty that, cool story. That, yeah, that is a really cool story. I and, finally uh, have a question. I just thought about it during the break. Okay. Um, you used to work for Tim Flowers, right? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit actually out in Winnipeg. How'd that go? Oh, it was great. You know, Tim. Tim's definitely a character. Uh, one of those guys that you can't help but learn from. He, he's, a, he's a veteran who, and everything he does looks sharp. I mean, it looks crisp. It looks solid. A lot, kind of like a Fit Finley. Um, we actually did an angle. Uh, myself and Chi-Chi Cruz were a tag team out in Winnipeg, which uh, was great territory uh, when you look back at the roster. I and mean, to see it now where all those guys have gone, it's incredible. But uh, against uh, my old partner, Joe, and Tim, and uh, it, it was it was good stuff. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, this, is, this is an interesting question. I never heard this before. Wow. This, is, uh, this says, is it true that when Vince Russo was in the WF, he wanted Edge to do a deaf mute angle? Um, I I had heard rumors. Um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, how true it was, but uh, I, I had heard rumors about it, and you know, people still come up to me to this day and and say, "Glad you're on a deaf mute." Um, so I, I don't know whose idea or, or or what, or if it was even true. But I heard the rumblings, and I I just gulped. I was like, "Oh God, no." <laughs> That's when you like think about getting nervous or something. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> they gave it to Kane. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is from Steve Gerwick, which is, is, has nothing to do with uh, with Edge, but uh, it does have something to do with what we talked about earlier. And he says that my full time job is a school teacher, like Bruce Mitchell. On a daily basis, I come in contact with kids ages five to fourteen, so kindergarten through eighth grade. The hot move right now with the younger kids is the worm. The sec most second and third graders that I talk with believe that they can do the worm and often attempt it. Children with better memories, the middle graders in particular, still like the stunner. So that's the older kids that grew up with it. Also popular right now are the pedigree, the rock bottom, the people's elbow. I knew the people's elbow. And the choke slam. He goes, I come in direct contact with 450 kids, and in my six years of teaching, I have never seen one kid attempt a WCW move. That's the scariest thing I've ever heard. In wow. fact, kids rarely talk about WCW. It's considered boring, consistent of old guys that the kids don't care about, Flair, Hogan, Page, etc. Now, I was always told, because, uh, you know, my, my girlfriend's younger brother uh, is a super big wrestling fan, and he's 12 years old, and uh, he he has talked about WCW. In fact, at one point, he was a real big WCW fan, but the one that he would talk, talk about was the Diamond Cutter when Page was really hot, which yeah. used to always kind of surprise me. But, uh, <laughs> Can you well, I think... Uh, any pedigree on there, friend? Uh, I guess they're doing pedigrees. I, I mean, 
I mean, I, rem- now, I remember I remember him telling me once. This is when I got really scared. He, we, he came by for a weekend, and um, we were just talking about wrestling. And he just goes, oh, yeah, we had a kid, you know, um, who got all bloody at school today. And he goes, what happened? In recess, they DDT'd him on a tree stump. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's so bad. I mean, you know what, though? It's going to happen. I mean, we were doing it when we were kids, too. It's just... Uh... Whether it's any kind of physicality, I mean, it, you, people, will, kids will run around and say, I mean, when I was growing up, Ninja Turtles, um, or G-Force, yeah, that's really old, but, uh, yeah, and nowadays kids will say Pokemon, whatever, yeah, or wrestling, it, it's always going to happen, kids always wrestle around, a lot of the times wrestling gets the blame for it, and uh, I don't think it's always fair, um, you know, kids will wrestle. But uh, back to the signature moves, I think it's just because the WWF does such a good job of, of making sure that it, the name of a move gets over. And really, in the WW, WCW, the only one I can think of is, like you said, a diamond cutter or Hogan's leg drop or, or the stinger splash. Stinger um, jackhammer with Goldberg. Oh, okay, they, they yeah. That one really yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's another one. And um, uh, But, I mean, a lot of them... Uh, any moves that are that are now happening in uh, WCW were coined in the WWF. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know. And when I think of uh, Scott Hall, I still think of the Razor's Edge. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, the way different company or different announcers, prom- you know, uh, promote the moves. I don't, I don't know. I've always, like, that's what's interesting to bring that up because, Years ago, when a lot of the new moves were being introduced from Mexico and Japan, you know, when yeah. wrestling was really starting to change in the United States based on younger wrestlers watching the videos from the other countries, and guys would be doing new moves, and the announcers would have no idea what it was, and they would never say anything. And, and I would go, like, you know, I would always be on the announcer's case, you know, and, and, and all of them. And Ross finally caught on, and Joey Styles actually caught on before Ross. He was the first one, and then Ross caught on. And then the guys in WCW, Tanae, I mean, Mike Tanae did, but the other yeah. ones, you know, almost had a mindset that we're not going to learn any new moves because we know wrestling, and all these moves should go away. Um, yeah. And I, I would always say that, like, then people go, well, what does it matter what the name of the move is if they call it right? And I, go, and I would always say, like, it doesn't matter what you call the move, but what matters is you call it consistently by the same name over and over again because then people react to it. A guy can do this spectacular move, and if it's not a move people are primed for, the reaction will not be nearly as good as yeah. a more simple move that people are primed for because it's been drummed into their head. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the people's elbow is a good example of that. Probably the most simple move in, in anyone's repertoire. It's an elbow drop, but uh, because it's been programmed in, uh, you know, I mean, look at how over it is. You know, and I remember guys doing helos or, or everything was a moonsault for a long time in the States. Any kind of flipping move or any kind of intricate move somehow ended up being a moonsault. Um, I remember that, uh, that, that era for a little while. Yeah. So, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts as far as you know? You were in that that match at uh, the match at WrestleMania, and of course the the, the, the other ladder match. Um, mm-hmm. You know where uh, Jeff Hardy did the one that, with that that senton or swanton off the top of the ladder, and and some really really crazy stuff. I mean, yeah. Sometimes you know when I watch watch those matches. In fact, the, the WrestleMania match came to my mind. It's like it's like you know yeah, it's it's a great match, but I get scared because it's like w- at what risk you know at what point does the risk you know, become too dangerous. Yeah, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line, exactly? Well, I think that's, uh, and that's a a danger that we've kind of fallen into where now if we were to do another one, then what do we do? You know, do you get a, instead of a 15-foot ladder, do you get a 25-foot ladder and and so on and so on? And I don't know, anything, any uh, risks I take are calculated um, because I want longevity. And... uh, I was watching Jeff as he was going up. I was on the outside, and I was like, "Oh, be okay. you know, be safe, Jeff. Be safe, be safe." And uh, I didn't, you know, didn't find out until later that he he was okay. He banged up his heels pretty good, but other than that, he he could walk. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it's one of those things where you do have to draw the line somewhere because if you don't do that again, then the fans won't be appeased. And then they'll say, oh, well, that wasn't as good. And, and you always want to live up to the billing, number one, and live up to your, your matches before. Um, so you, you have to be careful. You don't pigeonhole yourself into being this daredevil that, that people expect to see those things all the time. And I think uh, maybe a good example is a guy like Sabu. Um, I've never actually met him, but just from seeing maybe he's, he's just a hell of a seller. But uh, he looks like he's in pain. And I think, you know, he, he's known as the – 
the uh, suicidal homicidal, you know, I don't know the, the whole phrase, but, uh, you know, from doing moves like that, and that's what got him over. But at the same time, you have to wonder if at some point he should have drawn the line. And I think that's sometimes about Jeff. You know, Matt, Matt kind of got on to it a little bit. You know, you still give the people what they want, but uh, you still got to be careful. Yeah, because um, I, I just like, wor you know, sometimes you watch the stuff and you, you worry about, if it if if it takes this much to move some you know move the fans and they start expecting it I mean I, I just give an example is um the other night Ric Flair and uh, Vince Russo were brawling on the top of the cage similar to the Hell in the Cell on Nitro yeah. and a lot of people were going like you know they were disappointed because Vince Russo who's not even a trained wrestler didn't take a bump like Foley did or or Vince McMahon yeah. sort of did from almost because Vince was almost at the top of a, of, a, of a similar cage and and I was just thinking like you know like I mean a super trained bump taker I would I would hate to see do it, but I mean I guess if it's you know it's been done, but well, some, you know it's like you, it's something like people were actually expecting once he got up there he was going to take a bump off the cage because they have actually seen people do that. Yeah, I it's, uh, and, and the thing is, like the same bump the taker would hurt fell into the ring, and the cameras missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a lot. I mean, falling into the ring was okay. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let it edge. What did what, you just say? Well, I mean, a super trained bump taker would hurt himself, no matter what, no matter what people say about wrestling. You take that kind of fall, it hurts, whether you've been doing it for 10 years, whether you've been doing it for two months. Um, so someone who knows what they're doing will still, you know, jar themselves. Vince Russo would have killed himself. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of a precedent that's been set now. And, and anytime you do a match like that, you're almost pigeonholed to try and to top that. And, and that makes it really tough. <laughs> Uh, phys physically. This is from Kathy, yeah. who says, I have a question for Edge. He goes, I live in the Maritimes, and I was wondering how you enjoyed your time in Grand Prix Wrestling. Actually, you know what? I had a really good time. Um, it was uh, it was a good experience, and uh, didn't make much money, but I didn't expect to. So uh, so it, it was a good time. I wrestled uh, Bad News Brown in the main event every night for the first month, and then the second month I wrestled uh, Rick Martell and Don Callis in tag team matches with Christian. So it was a really good time, and uh, we lived in Moncton in a little apartment uh, just off the university. Had a great time and a lot of fun. Did you did you talk a lot to uh, to Bad News Allen or when, when you were when you were working out there with him? Oh, yeah. Uh, Bad News, uh, we, we've done a lot of tours together, whether it was Winnipeg or uh, Bad News actually got Christian Knight to uh, Japan. Um, so he's uh, he's done a lot for us, and, and we've learned a lot from him. He's a great guy. We, we, had him as a guest on, we had him as a guest on the show. He, his stories were phenomenal. Oh, he, he has got so many awesome stories. We've done like 12-hour drives, and he's just, you know, talked the whole time with his stories. Yeah. Great stuff, really good stuff, yeah. interesting stuff. Let's get back to the phone calls. We'll go to Casey in Tennessee. Casey, you're up with Edge. Hi, Edge. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, I have two questions for you. Okay. Uh, what would you be if you were not a wrestler right now? I I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Casey. What would you uh, be if you weren't a wrestler right now? Can you repeat that one for me, Dave? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, she goes, uh, what, what would you be if you were not a pro wrestler? What would I be? Yikes. Uh, that's a scary <laughs> thought because this is all I ever wanted to do. Um, I, you know, I've always wanted to entertain, and uh, I, I don't know if uh, I was meant to or what, but I've always pictured myself in front of a group of people doing something. Um, and uh, to me, wrestling uh, was what I wanted to do because it was physical. It was in front of people. If I wasn't doing that, geez, I don't know. Um, I've had a little bit of fun with acting. It's a little bit more tedious and monotonous than I thought it was going to be, but uh, that's fun. Um, maybe maybe hockey I would have gone after. Um, you know, being Canadian, that's what we're all born and bred on. Um, but that, that's tough. And I went to college for radio broadcasting, so that might have been uh, I might have dipped into that. Who knows? <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to know. <laughs> <laughs> my my next question is: When do you plan on getting married? Uh, we haven't set a date yet, actually. We just uh, we closed on our first house in Tampa. We move into that June 30th, and then uh, from there we're going to set a date. We're, we're not in a huge rush. We kind of want to get all of our furniture and everything moved in, get those headaches out of the way, and, and then we'll, we'll set a date and try and uh, get all of that uh, ironed out. So I would imagine sometime next year, though. Oh. Can you do me a favor? I'm sorry? Can you do me a favor? Am I what? It depends on what the favor is. <laughs> uh, my okay. friend, Ashley, is sitting right next to me, and she's crying. She is your number one fan, and I was wondering okay. if you could say hi to her. Sure. <laughs> Get her on the phone. Hold on. 
That wasn't too Hello? bad. I, I'm always afraid when they ask when they ask if you'll do a favor and you don't know what the favor is. It's yeah, it's to say scary. yeah, it's like uh oh, what I got myself into. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Go, go. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. See, before if I do this and I said hello, no one recognized my voice because I never talked. <laughs> so now, now I guess that's a good thing. They recognize my voice. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm sitting on a gas station waiting for a seat. I, that's what all the noise is about. I've just been filling my truck up with gas. So. Oh, there we go. Back in the truck. <laughs> any, any, any questions, Ashley? Yeah. Ed, when are you going to come do an autograph session in Nashville? In Nashville? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not really up to me. I just kind of go where they send me. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Call Double Jeff and say you uh, you want us in Nashville. Um, generally, uh, I just get my booking sheets and and uh, wherever we have uh, autograph sessions, I show up. Okay. Well, I think I okay. might do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Oh. Thank you so much for talking to me. You're you're welcome. You have a good night, nice night. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye bye. Think we've ever had a call like that. We we have never had a call like that ever. We have never had we have never had an orgasmic reaction on the phone in the history of this show. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Uh, my mom ends up getting all my letters. Um, so uh, when I when I come up to Toronto, I have like a whole bunch of letters to go through, and uh, it's pretty much the same theme throughout all of them. A lot of a lot of teenage girls and a lot of oh my gods and things like that, which is flattering. Um, but and one thing that I didn't honestly really expect, but uh, at the same time. When I first came in, um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I never thought I could be a face in, in the climate of today's, uh, you know, wrestling. And when it ended up that I, it seemed like I was getting face reactions, I was surprised. And then the whole brood thing, and then the brood became faces, and I didn't think I'd become a heel after a while. Um, and uh, then the guys kind of started turning on us, and, and I kind of realized that with all the teenage girls writing, maybe that was why. <laughs> You know, um, it's real interesting though. Even even now, when you guys come out and um, and you're doing the total heel character, the the initial response is that scream. That you know, I mean, well, it, I, I I haven't heard a lot of that in wrestling. The Hardys are getting it too, but I remember like the Von Erichs used to get that 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 initial scream at the matches <laughs> when they would first like the, the, the you know when they first walked through the curtain or, or whatever. Well, it's uh, it's strange, and it, like I said, it's flattering. I think it's just the, the hair, to be honest. You cut off our hair, and then <laughs> I don't think those screams will happen. But uh, I don't know. It's weird too. Now, now that we're doing this character, I notice guys our age are now on our side, whereas before they hated us. Um, I mean, not all of them. Now there's a lot of them that uh, you know have pretty degrading signs, but a lot of them now before would have been, you know, hating us. But now they I, they get a kick out of what we're doing. They're laughing. They're, you know, having fun, which, I mean, as long as they're reacting one way or the other, I guess that's all that matters are being entertained. But I think uh, right now our, our whole objective, uh, objective is to uh, get people annoyed with us, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, this, is, this is from Adam who says, um, uh, you seem to be very natural and confident as a heel. Do you enjoy being a heel over a face? And uh, do you have any inspirations as far as your heel character? Like, were there any heels that you watched tapes of that you kind of, like, picked up a lot from? Um, to answer the first one, being a heel is a lot more fun um, just because I've always found it's a lot easier to get people to hate you than like you. Um, with that being said, being a babyface is fun, too. Um, yeah, a lot of fun, actually. You know what? Either or, but I have to admit being a little bit more fun because right now I'm being Adam Copeland a lot more than, than you know, the original Edge, the, the mysterious enigma. That that wasn't me, and I didn't know how to uh, how to treat that character, and I think it showed. Um, the Brood, a little bit more of Adam came out and uh, was a little bit more successful. And now this is a lot more like me, so uh, I'm having a lot more fun with it, to be honest. And I always wanted the opportunity to uh, cut promos and speak and show that that I could do it, and uh, or both of us could do it, and um, so we're, we're having a lot more fun now. I'd have to admit, yeah. Uh, heels, yikes! Uh, Shawn Michaels, I, you know, I always watch Shawn, and uh, when I really started to get into Shawn, I mean, I was I was a big Rockers fan, but when he turned heel, I was like, yeah, this guy is, he's the next guy. Um, so. Uh, that uh, and I'd like to think we kind of put a little bit more of a 
maybe an intelligent twist on being a heel than most guys do. Um, maybe we don't. I don't know. We, we try and do it where we're talking down our noses at people um, as opposed to saying, you know, we're going to kick your stinking butt, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But uh, it, I guess Shawn Michaels would be the, the big one. Okay. okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia. So here's today's question. What city was the first ever Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair match held in? And I will tell you that I won't tell you where it's not. Well, it wasn't Madison Square Garden, so I guess I could tell you that's where it certainly wasn't. Uh, we are back here with Edge, and of course we have Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly here as well. We've got a ton of emails and uh, a couple of calls. Uh, let's get to Chris in Detroit. Chris, you're next up with Edge. Hey, what's up, Edge? Chris, how are you doing, Chris? Uh, Brian. Uh, I just got a question. I am kind of go back a few years with you, Edge. I used to go to some of the shows locally here in the Michigan, Detroit area, and I just was wondering yep. what was some of your opinions of it, and what were some of your favorite angles or moments from working here in Detroit. Um, actually, I always like going back to Detroit too because I see uh, the same little group full of fans that, that were there at a lot of my indie uh, indie dates. So it's kind of cool. It almost feels I've always said that Toronto, uh, in a way, Hamilton because it was my first match in Detroit, feel like three hometowns. Um, so I, I always enjoy going back to Detroit, like I said. But uh, let's see, I enjoyed Thug Life a lot. Um, you know that little group that we had, yep, and uh, that. that that was a lot of fun. And a really strange thing too is we had started doing that Canadian thing two weeks before those guys started doing it in the WWF. And uh, I know they didn't, you know, bite the idea or anything. It just happened at the same time. But we were like, oh man, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it uh, that was a lot of fun. The whole band of US thing that like we did, and uh, having Rhino and Joe, myself, Christian, it was fun. Wasn't there like a point where like Joe, like they did an angle or? Something? something where Joey was pissed at you because you chose Christian over him and he was looking for a partner or something. Yeah, yeah, they did the whole deal where they were both arguing over my services, I guess, as a tag team partner. And, uh, you know, they fought, and then Joe and I fought, and uh, it was uh, worked each other. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, that, but that was after a little while, after we uh, wreaked havoc over the, the couple of companies there for a little while. Right. Um, okay, and one other question I have for you. Do you have any more – you said you mentioned you wrestled in Japan. Do you have any more aspirations of ever going back? Because, I mean, I think, like, like, especially with the roster you guys have now, if you guys could ever hook up something with, like, a All Japan or whatever, where you guys could, like, take on guys like Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi, and Akiyama, I think that's, like, right now with the WWF wrestlers that you guys have, with being able to work the style and everything, um, that you guys would be able to pull it off now compared to five years ago when you had the big, you know, oaf lumping around. Yeah, well, it, it'd definitely be a lot of fun. I mean, uh, just from wrestling guys that style, uh, like Johnny Smith, I wrestled Johnny Smith before, who's, uh, you know, all Japan through and through, and I loved wrestling him. His, his style is, is just really cool and crisp, and it, it's, it was a lot of fun. You know, wrestling, uh, I haven't got to wrestle Ben yet, which I'm totally looking forward to, but uh, Chris Jericho and I have, uh, you know, worked each other a few times, and just that whole Japanese style, it's nice, it's stiff, it's snug. Um, a lot of the Canadian guys work that way, too. Do, mind you, a lot of Americans do too. So, but it's a lot of fun. I think uh, I definitely like to go back to Japan someday. Um, whether you know it was with the WWF or not, uh, who, who knows what the future holds. But I'd like to go back uh, again. Although I hate the food and I lost you know like nine pounds in nine days the last time I was there. But uh, you know, other than that, you know, I'd, I'd like to do it again. Yeah. Okay, the crowd well, over there. My last question is, uh, is there anybody, like, are any, like, is anybody in the, your guys, you know, locker room, does anybody ever watch tapes of Japan or anything? I always just wonder that, because I, sometimes I watch Venus, and I see him doing some of, like, Akiyama stuff, because they'll do, like, yeah. the, uh, that blue thunder where he'll get the guy in the German suplex and turn it around into a, uh, into a uh, power bomb, and he also, like, sometimes he'll pull out the exploder as well, and I just wonder, like, if he ever, like, you know, if some of you guys ever, like, grab some of the stuff that you see over there. Well, Val's a big All Japan fan, and he did some tours for them before. Um, so he likes to try and incorporate some of that stuff into his style. Um, uh, generally, I know from my own experience, I, I actually don't have any Japanese wrestling tapes. Um, I always want to get my hands on some, but it, it just ends up that you, it doesn't seem like you have any time. Um, we're on the road so much that we don't get an opportunity to see any tapes. The only stuff you get to see is our shows or, or WCW. Uh, when I'm at home, I'm still always thinking spots and everything, but I'll go back to my library of, of Brett and Sean and Ted DiBiase and Bob Orton and guys like that, take what they've done, put my own little twist on it and tweak it up a little bit and uh, try and make it a little bit different. Um, 
Japanese wise, I, I don't really, uh, like I said, have anything in my catalog, but uh, I'd like to one day just to take what they've done and make it uh, a little bit more of my own as opposed to theirs. Okay, hey, thanks a lot, guys, and keep up the great work, Dave, on the show. I enjoy it a lot. Okay, thanks a bunch, Chris. Let's go to Josh in Tennessee. Josh, you're next up. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Josh. Uh, I was just uh, wanted to say, first off, to, to Edge, I'm a big fan, uh, really liking what you guys are doing with the new direction oh, for the you. characters. Um, I was wondering if, if there's any plans in place for maybe a name for the tag team uh, for you and Christian. Have you all thought about any names? Like a lot of times you hear uh, or two as Maple Leaf Blondes, uh, Suicide Blondes, things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I, we at first, I think it's a little too late now, yeah. almost, to, to come up with a tag team name. And, uh, you know, we did the Suicide Blondes thing, but, you know, I don't think I'd like that in the WWF. I don't think it would fit. Um, we, we just, we were trying to think of a name, and that just kind of stuck. Um, and at that point, we were doing uh, basically what we're doing now. But when we first started teaming, we were still, you know, the mysterious, uh, the two mysterious guys that came through the crowd. So to come up with a tag right. team name, you know, the brood would have worked. Um, but see, it wouldn't work now. So I, I think we're probably, you know, I always just call us ENT. It just seems e easier. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. But I think that to change it now, it, it wouldn't really work. And I've always liked the fact that we still have two separate identities that way. Right. Once you get, uh, it's almost like you get pigeonholed when you get a tag team name. It's like, oh, that's that guy from the Brain Busters or, or something like that. As opposed to, yeah. I, Arn Anderson came out of it, but uh, for a while he's probably Arn Anderson, that guy in the Brain Busters. Exactly. That's that's a good point. You always hear like. Uh, Smash referred to as demolition smash or demolition. Yeah, smash. yeah, and and that's one thing I've always enjoyed that we're just he's Christian, I'm Edge. Right. Well, that's a good point. The, the other thing I wanted to know is, uh, you guys have been teaming with Kurt Angle a lot, which has been great, made for some really uh, not only good matches but some hilarious TV. Uh, are y'all uh, interested in maybe staying with him? Is there a stable maybe forming, or is that possible? I'm sorry, I missed that last part. Um, would y'all continue teaming with Kurt? Uh, could y'all possibly be forming a stable, maybe adding some more guys to it, or is it just uh, you three right now? Um, the, the thing with Kurt, it, it just seems like a natural. Uh, we all kind of, the three of us do the same kind of thing. Um, I, I've always kind of looked at it like we're the tag team version of Kurt Angle, and he's a singles version of Edge and Christian. Uh, not appearance-wise, not wrestling-wise, but uh, just attitude-wise. And even in the back, I mean, the three of us are all, you know, basically best friends. Um, so it just seemed like a natural. We, we all uh, operate the same way, and, uh, it, and it's entertaining. We're having fun. When you see us out there, if we're laughing, we're laughing because we're having a really good time. And uh, we're, we're having a good time, you know, pissing people, people off. Yeah, well, I know the fans are enjoying it. I just wanted to say, uh, been a big fan of yours for a while, and it's good to see uh, you finally getting the character development I think you needed. And, uh, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Doing a great job on the mic. So uh, keep up the good work. Looking forward to seeing you. In thank the you very much. Come. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. You ever had a problem coming through the crowd? Um, sometimes, uh, not anything real threatening or anything like that, but, uh, you know, you have, uh, tough guys that, uh, as you're walking downstairs with sunglasses on, there's no lights on that try and push you. Um, you know, you have, uh, well, like I said before, teenage girls that kind of try and tear at your coat and stuff, or, you know, I've lost some hair, but, uh, other than that, it's not been too bad. My, my, uh, debut on, uh, heat, I guess. Uh, I think it was the first heat ever was against Jeff Jarrett in Anaheim. And I was going through the crowd. I thought I was cutting right to go through a path, but it was a bunch of chairs. And I knocked over like four girls, landed on top of them. You know, I, I disappeared for four seconds on TV. And, uh, oh, that's just too good. <laughs> yeah. It, and I knew it was going on. I don't think anyone else did, hopefully. Um, but uh, just totally bowled them over. And, uh, you know, I don't think they were too upset about it, but it, it was embarrassing. So I got up and went in and did the match, but uh, you know th little things like that. And I remember one time in Chicago, some guy, uh, you know, jumped in front of me, and I had to shove him out of my way, and it got picked up on TV. Um, just things like that. I mean, when when you're in that mode, you're getting ready to go to the ring, and you want to get there just due to time constraints for the match. If anybody gets in your way, you just start stiff arming them. You know, it's uh, you have to. <laughs> that, that, that but I'm glad I don't come through the ring through the crowd now. 
That scene, that scene in uh, that you just described. I, someday someone has got to do a wrestling movie and 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 do like a, a spoof of your character who does that all the time. <laughs> just try to throw people around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just like you know, like uh, it's supposed to go left, goes right, you know, or something. And, and fall, yeah. It wouldn't be much of a spoof. It'd be me. <laughs> it happened more than once, but that's the one I really remember. We got, I want to make a quick mention that um, this is when we do these trivia questions, we either get no response or we get the answers within like a minute. So anyway, two correct answers already. Andrew Wallace of Essex, Essex UK, and Daryl Scully of Auckland, New Zealand. They got the question. The, uh, the first Hogan Ric Flair match was held in Dayton, Ohio. So I did not uh, know that. Yeah, the, the first advertised match was in Oakland, California, but they actually did a match that was unadvertised in Dayton as a dark match at a TV taping, like three or four days earlier. Wow. Uh, let, let's let's head to Vincent in uh, New Jersey. Vince, you're up with Edge. Hi, hey Dave, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey Vince, how you doing? Hey, um, Vince, how you doing? I've um, been a fan for a while, and I was wondering. Well, me and my friends, we always talk like, oh, Edge and Christian and the Hardy Boys, and these guys are going to go have great singles careers. And um, you think we're now with the Mike skills? That you have in the whole that whole new attitude, that you will be a singles wrestler faster than any any of the the three of them. Dave, can you translate? I missed all of that. Oh, okay, he was just wondering if uh, if you thought no, that you were going to be you you were going to be broken, you know, if you and the two Hardy brothers and Christian, if you thought you would be broken into a singles wrestler uh, quicker than the other three because of your mic skills. Um. I think Christian has mic skills too, so uh, I don't think it would be because of mic skills. Um, and and the Hardys will too once they get a chance to develop them. Um, I mean, when we first started doing them, we were just nervous. We and the four of us have never had an opportunity to do promos before. These ones you're seeing of Christian that Christian and I are doing, these are the first ones we've done, and we're having to do them in front of a nationwide audience. Um, but we wanted to do them, and I, I hope that we're doing an okay job. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that'll break me apart from the other three quicker. But I think the Hardy Boys are definitely a team. When people think the Hardy Boys, they think the Hardy Boys. They don't think of Matt or Jeff Hardy um, so much. I don't think. And I think they'll be a team for a while. Whereas who knows with Christian and I? It's, it's been rumored we'll break up. We'll be together. We'll break up. We'll be together. Um, I think we're more. Uh, we it's. Hmm. <laughs> That's a tough question. But, uh, I mean, they even look like a team, whereas Christian and I have always tried to keep our own identity. And I think in the back of our minds, it's always because eventually we know we're going to go singles. Um, and who excels further past that, who knows? Okay. Um, can I ask one more question? Is that how the first um, comedy you did, I guess you did, if that's the word for it, uh, were you guys like, having stage fight by any chance? Or? Oh, but for the first time you started doing this gimmick, did you like? Were you scared about like uh, the fir for the first time you you started in this in this thing? Um, I mean, the first time that uh, you know you, you try to, it's like my first match on Raw. You try not to think about how many people are at home watching, and uh, I was a little bit nervous, yeah. But uh, you know, once I started rolling, I just thought about everything and just wanted to get my point across and get a little bit of my character and, and try and be, you know, just uh, forge a new path for the character of Edge. And, and now, uh, you know, I still get a little bit of butterflies. I, I, I don't get butterflies about wrestling matches now. I get butterflies about my promos <laughs> because I want them to be entertaining and, and hopefully people will react the same way as, uh, as I do as I'm thinking of them, of them along with, you know, the other guys. Um, but that, that's when I get uh, a little bit nervous with matches. Don't do it anymore. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Ed. No problem. Okay, uh, before we hit before we hit a break, I want to mention I got a couple of emails here. This is from Chris Viola, who says uh, your first pay per view was SummerSlam '98, and you teamed with Sable. It kind of came out of the blue, was never explained, and never went anywhere. Um, and he's and he's just going like, uh, was were you supposed to be? I mean, how how did that come about? And uh, at the time, did you think it was going to be a long term thing, or was it just something that came and went? I think it was just something that came and went. Uh, I think maybe at some point it was, you know, talked about that we'd be together, but it was just the uh, right place at the right time. Um, I just started. Uh, no one knew who the partner would be, and I guess it just seemed like the right thing to do. Although what made it hard that night was I think that night Sean and her danced in the ring or something to that effect, so everyone was hoping it would be Sean. Um, but I think it was a pretty entertaining match, and I had fun doing it. Uh, you know, I got one under my belt and could move on from there. But, yeah, it was just one of those things that uh, happen a lot in wrestling. You do it once, and that's it. When you when you first were introduced, I, I sensed it as sort of a, a, a ravenish character, you mm -hmm. know, uh, with, the, with the original vignettes. By the way, someone asked, and I, I, um, 
Where were those vignettes originally filmed? They were actually all filmed in New York City, uh, between, you know, Brooklyn and the Bronx and all over the place. And uh, they were a lot of fun. And at that point, no one really knew what Edge was. It was just Edge. He's this, uh, you know, originally it was supposed to be like a 90s modern-day Jim Morrison, which I never really felt comfortable with because, you know, what was I supposed to be, like this guy that walked down the ramp in a drug-induced haze? I, I didn't know what it was, where to go with it. Um, and that's, I think it shows in my first few matches. I didn't know what to do, you know, uh, and like I've said before, the brood really helped with that. It kind of uh, made me feel comfortable. I was with two guys that I enjoyed working with, and we were all just having fun. And uh, once I started having fun and not being stressed out about what I should do in between moves, how I should react to the crowd, things like that, it made it a lot more easy and comfortable. And uh, this is from uh, Chris Hussein, who wants to know uh, where uh, you and uh, Christian went to school in Toronto. Um, actually, we uh, we went to uh, Orange Hill District uh, Secondary School. Uh, that was our high school, and then we went to Humber College together too. Uh, we actually uh, ended up living in a place with our three other best friends, um, and we all went to the same college. So we went to, uh, like I said before, Prince Elizabeth Public School. From there, ODSS. From there to Humber College. And uh, also, this is uh, this is asking, uh, what did, what, how was how was uh, doing the movie or the um, the TV show Highlander when you were in the movie? It was actually the movie, the, the fourth movie in, in the series, and uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, it, uh, I mentioned before about acting being a little bit more tedious than I thought it was, and it was, and it was a lot more monotonous. And, and you know, so many wrestling, it's, it's one or two takes you've done, and in front of the crowd, it's definitely one take. Um, but in comparison, you know, all of a sudden, it's 14 hours. Uh, so when you use the thing snapping off really quickly and it's taking, you know, forever, it was a... Oh, we're losing him. Oh, uh, okay. he's on his, I guess his cell phone's going down. Maybe he went through a tunnel. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, anyway, um, that's when we get him back. I guess, uh, yeah, we should probably hit some, hit some phone calls. Uh, let's get to, uh, Liam in Boston until we get, uh, Edge back. Hey guys, how's Leo, going? how you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. Doing, so, doing really good. Um, good. I um, I actually had a question for Adam, but I was going to ask you what. You guys... He's 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 on. He's on. Oh. So oh, don't, don't worry about that. Yeah. Adam, how's it going? Okay. Um, We've got uh, William from Boston on it. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if there was a reason that they switched the finish from the downward spiral to the spear. If if there's a reason for what? Sorry. For, uh, that it's... they switched the finish. They switch your finish from the downward spiral to the spear. Um, it, you know what? The spear's not really my finish per se. I just, you know, it fits well and the people react. Um, and depending on the person who's taking it, I, I, I won't use it. Um, so I'd still like to use the spiral, but at the same time, it's one of those moves that it looks like I'm taking just as much punishment as my opponent, and it doesn't get the reaction I've always wanted. So I've, I've been trying to think of something else to use um, that would, uh, you know, keeping in mind things that I could do to, like, any opponent or good reversals if I'm working someone like Rock or someone like, uh, you know, uh, Stone Cold or a Helmsley, good reversals in and out of moves that, uh, you know, will we'll take the fans on a nice little ride. And I thought the spiral would do that. I When I first uh, thought of it, uh, of using it, I thought of, you know, reversals with uh, Shawn Michaels' sweet chin music or with the stunner or with, uh, you know, the rock bottom. Um, but it just, uh, maybe I didn't use it enough for it to catch on, but I'm just not sure it looks good enough, to be honest. Hmm. So the the spear was just kind of one of those things that I started doing when I was shooting Gangrel because it, it had intensity and our, our shoot was supposed to be, our angle was intense. Um, and it just kind of stuck from there because people started reacting and you kind of go with what works. Um, but if anyone has any ideas, feel free to tell me. <laughs> Brian, you got any good hold ideas? Hmm. The Blue Thunder. Steal it from Val. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have to think of something that I could do to a guy that's the size of, you know, Rikishi, too. So uh, that's the hard part. Um, I just had one last a... question. Um, what do you guys think is the best tag team finish of all time? I guess this relates to Adam somewhat. You know what? They don't have one. This is a strange one uh, because uh, Bubba, Matt Hardy, and I were talking about this the other day, like two days ago, what we thought was the best uh, tag team finisher of all time. And we said the 3D has to be up there. Um, I think uh, 
event omega, as the Hardys call it, the, the splash leg drop is a cool one. But one that always sticks out on my mind is the uh, the heart attack clothesline. Um, oh, that, you know, yeah. The, the Heart Foundation, it, it was simple but effective, um, you know, and I, I tried to think of one for the Rockers. Being such a great team, they never had any good finishing moves, and I, I, I hope Christian and I don't go down as one of those teams because we use the stack plex, which is, uh, you know, the, the suplex off the shoulder, superplex off the shoulders, which is pretty impressive looking, but we don't use it, uh, you know, every match, so therefore it's not considered a finish. And now that we're heels, it's like, okay, well, we use the belt, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, being a heel, you don't get too many straight finishes over guys so you you, you use uh, gimmicks here and there to get yourself over as a heel so now uh, you know team move wise I mean we have all kinds we could use but it just doesn't really fit right now um, other tag team finishers that I like I mean the Legion of the Doomsday device was insane yeah. um, so I think those would have to be uh, you know the top ones that I can think of yeah I think the 3D has to be the best um, the Midnight it's... Express has some good ones the Midnight Terrors had great double team moves, but um, I mean their finish was usually just Bobby Eaton, you know, like a TV squash finish was usually Bobby Eaton's leg drop or um, Dennis Condry doing kind of a reverse Russian leg sweep. Well, with Stan yeah, Lane, they did the uh, they called it the Vegematic, I think, where Lane held him for the leg drop. Right. Yeah, the little bear hug with the leg drop. That was a good one too, too. Which Too Cool uses. They call it the hip hop drop now. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know another good one was Power and Glory. The, the super I was just going to say that. I was just <laughs> going to say Power and Glory. It, to yeah. be honest, Christian and I talked about biting that and then possibly having that as our new finish. So who knows? Maybe you could see it. Um, you know what I liked when it when it first came. I mean, I thought this was the most awesome thing I ever saw was um, you know, and now it's actually done. I wouldn't say routinely, but um, where you know uh, the Bulldogs when like uh, Davy Boy would have somebody up on uh, his shoulders and then Dynamite would do the top rope drop kick. Yeah, yeah, and he jump off of the guy's back. No, no, that was another one where. Um, where oh, um, okay. You're talking if he has an electric chair and dynamite does a drop kick. Actually, we're drop kick. Of, yeah. Yeah, I got you. We were actually going to do that in one of uh, our matches with the Hardys, but never got around to it because of time, which is that's kind of strange. We, uh, we we talked about doing that, so uh, who knows? Maybe we we'll cracked that one out too. Hmm. Yeah. But I I, lo- I like that uh, the, the superplex thing, you know. I mean, because. Uh, I saw, you know, somebody did this. I just saw a picture of this. I don't remember which company this would be. I think it's it was a Japanese picture mm-hmm. where there were two guys. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I just saw it within the last two weeks where, you know, it was like a guy on a shoulder, and then there was a second guy, and they did the superplex, okay. which, was, which was really, like, scary. I got gotcha. you. Wow. Yeah. Yikes. That, that's a lot on the lower guy. I don't know if I could hold all that weight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But uh, it's hard enough with that one as it is. But, yeah, it's amazing with some of those Japanese magazines. You see those pictures, and you're like, what are they doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You don't under- a lot of the time you see it, and you don't understand what's happened just because of the sequence and everything. But uh, some good ideas over there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, you know what? There's probably some, like, unbelievable stuff in Mexico, too. But mostly on the shoulders, uh, like a diving crook and rana. Yeah, I'm throwing yeah. up. You know what I used to love was when they throw the guy like like uh, you run across and the, the the partner like throws you and you you do the hurricane rana off of it or, or I've even seen like a, a monkey flip into a hurricane rana you know I mean that's not something that you guys oh, okay. do but but yeah. um Ray you know where your partner yeah with Ray Jr. Jun- with Ray Jr. and Conan yeah yeah that, that'd be cool too I mean it's it's possible it just depends on if uh, you know a lot of guys. Uh, I, I'm real leery on doing, uh, you know, hurricanes now, just because not everyone seems to know how to take them properly. Um, you, you got a, you know, a bunch of guys that can, but there's a lot of guys who can't. So, what you have to do, and this was the hardest part, is do moves that everyone can do, and it can make for a, you know, it, it waters down your your uh, repertoire a little bit, but you kind of have to, and because once you start doing those certain moves that everyone can take or do. People expect to see them, um, and that's one thing I think that we really why we enjoy wrestling the Hardys because we can take anything they do and vice versa. Um, so uh, you know that's why we'll take a few more risks when we're working those guys. Anything else, William? Um, no, just tell me Josie isn't coming back for revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, yeah, he I, I I was tired of him. <laughs> How quick the second time he was on. I don't know. I mean, you might have liked him, but that was just like, that one I didn't like. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, guys. 
Take okay. it easy. I had a question yeah, about the uh, last pay-per-view in your match. It was a very strange finish. Oh, yeah. What was the deal? Oh. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't the finish. <laughs> um, it, uh, whose fault it was, I don't know. But uh, Kurt was uh, going to break that pin up. Um, I couldn't see him. I was watching Teddy. Teddy was counting. I was like, if I don't kick out here, then this is going to be the finish. So whether I kicked out before the three is up for debate, who knows? It was, I mean, within a hair either way. Um, but Kurt was going to make the save, and then we're going to go to an, into a different finish from there. We just wanted a good false finish, which it would have been, which I still kicked myself over. Uh, mind you, to be honest, you know, it uh, wasn't really anybody's fault. It was just, you know, uh, some thought Kurt was there a little bit late. Some thought Teddy, you know, shouldn't have counted all the way through. Or, you know, in either case, I wasn't supposed to kick out. It was supposed to be a save. Um, so I just kind of tried to kick to, to save it as a false finish and go to finish from there. But, I mean, it still worked. You know, the crowd counted along, which if they're doing that, that means you've done your job. So Let's go to Joe, let's go to Joe in Philadelphia. Joe, you're up with that. Uh, how you guys doing? Good. Um, I was just uh, two things. First was um, how did it feel to be in the match with uh, Rock since he's like the man and like how was it, was there more of a significance and also um, Kurt Angle is my pick for King of the Ring because like Jericho doesn't need it and Benoit has the IC belt. What's your thought on the King of the Ring? Do you have any thoughts uh, on the King of the Ring or, or do you even or, or if you if you know you better not tell us. <laughs> uh, do I have any any sorry any? Oh, I mean, just any any thoughts as far as uh, what any thoughts on think? King of the Ring? Yeah, where do you um, think it should go? Um, Unless you see. know, and if you, can, if you know, then don't tell us. No, I, oh, are you kidding? I don't know who I'm working <laughs> in King of the Ring. Um, who could I, I could see? Uh, who, you can usually pick a handful of four or five guys who you can tell are going to go fairly far in the King of the Ring. But then when you think that, they'll throw in a couple of guys just to, to I think, throw people off um, and keep people on their toes. Uh, this year, geez, I don't know. I, I would have predicted uh, Benoit before, but now he's got the IC strap, mm -hmm. so does he need the King of the Ring? No. Um, so, holy. Yeah, I, think I don't know. I, I could see. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of someone who, who could could use that little extra push. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I honestly don't know. Mm. Your guess is as good as mine on that one. How about the match with The Rock? How do you think about that? I, I was really happy with that. Uh, you know, we got comments that we picked it up a notch for that match. And um, looking back, I think maybe we did. You know, we, we bumped a little faster, a little more crisp. Uh, we kind of got into the role of, of being a heel a little bit more than, than before. And I think that's when you're working the top face in, in the industry. Yeah, um, really you kind of get yourself a little bit more jacked up to, to make sure that you're feeding well and everything like that. And... Um, you know, I, looking back, I was really happy with it and happy with the way it turned out. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Um, Take it easy. You know, uh, I was going to ask you, like, when you first got in, so you got you got into the WWF originally, I guess, late 97. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at, was there a point, did you see what, what, what happened in the WWF as far as, you know, just taking off to this level? Did you see it before it, 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 it actually happened, like, or when it happened, were you kind of like, wow, how did we ever get here? Um... I kind of uh, had my foot in the door as it was starting to happen and then just lucked into being in the right place at the right time as it exploded. And um, to me, I could I could see it happening when, when Stone Cold was in the studio throwing things around and, and uh, him and Brett were going into that feud. That's when I started to see something special, pretty special happening. Um, and, uh, and then shortly thereafter, I was in the company and, and watching it, you know, yeah. sitting there watching it. So... Uh, I think, uh, you know, people have said it before, but I think that with the whole Stone Cold Brett thing, it started to, to really explode. As a, as a, you know, I thought that one of the real, you know, things about that, that whole feud, what made it so unique was the coincidence that they had so many Canadian television tapings. And it really, yes. I just seemed to feel the Canadian television tapings built the heat so much because they'd go back, you know, like they do the, the, the a, a Halifax show or something, and they were so pro Bret Hart that when they got to Pittsburgh or Cleveland the next week for Raw, the people were just like twice as mad because of what they had just watched on TV. Yeah. And, I was actually and, at that that Halifax taping and I, I 
that's one of the loudest crowds I have ever heard in my life. It, coupled with the fact that the, we rarely go to Halifax, but also, I mean, it just it, it stirred up emotions in Canada uh, because we're always considered, you know, the second United States and things like that. So when it's being addressed on on TV by a guy who is an icon in Canada, it uh, it really starts stirring emotions. And it, it was it was the uh, you know those. Canadian TV tapings were insane, crowd reaction-wise, which is strange from Canada because a lot of times you find Canadian crowds, you know, have a reputation of being a little bit more polite and sitting on their hands a little bit more than the American crowds. Really? Because yeah, I, um, I yeah, well, or, or maybe it's just, you know, for instance, in the Sky Dome, they're, they're a good crowd, but because it's so big, the sound goes straight up. Um, so it uh, that that tends to affect the crowd reaction a lot of times too. But uh, yeah, I, I, when you compare, there's certain cities that that never react well. New Haven, they don't react. Um, Anaheim can be that way sometimes. Um, cities that we go to a lot besides New York uh, seem to react that way. Long Island's another one where Nassau, they just sit there. And sometimes Canadian crowds can be that way, like Ottawa. And Montreal's usually pretty good. Toronto's usually pretty good. But uh, actually Vancouver is too. It, it just it all depends, I guess. Did uh, no, no, you never actually, did you ever wrestle in the, in the Calgary area? Or did you just never get there? Uh, no, but before the WWF, I never actually wrestled there. I went out to train at Brett's there, so I was there on two separate occasions to to do some training at his place, so he get he could you know see what I was up to, and uh, that that was kind of the first steps into getting to the WWF. Uh, also, um, now, now which group did you work for when you went to Japan? Uh, it was called Tokyo Pro. It was an independent. And, uh, you know, we went over there for a couple of tours and, and had a lot of fun. You know, it, uh, it was an experience. And, um, you know, it, it was good to get in with guys who can't speak English and just, and just go. Um, so that was different for us at the time, too, and especially the, uh, the different crowds, you know, how they, they applaud as opposed to cheer. That was a little strange for us at first, but it, it was fun. I have a anyway, question um, real quick. Um, okay, go ahead. What was it like when uh, Michaels came back like three weeks ago? Because I know some of the older guys, I guess, aren't people that are that old. But, I mean, some of the guys who were there when he was there kind of had a little bit of heat with him. But, I mean, as far as like a lot of the younger guys are just getting in, they just have to see him as like this legend. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Mike, uh, Sean was, was still around when I first uh, was uh, getting in, and he was, he was never anything but nice to me and always with advice and things like that. And I think you can kind of see guys who, who have tailored their style after him. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't see any problems. But mind you, I'm one of those guys that just kind of does my thing, says hi to everybody, tries to go along with everybody, and uh, just go out and have fun because when you don't have fun in there, that's when you, you start to get miserable. I mean, if you're having fun, I, how many people can say they enjoy the, what they do for a living? And I do, so. I, I guess on that note, we should probably wrap that up. Um, I want to thank you very much. This was, re this was a really fun show, and we really oh, enjoyed good. it. I, I had a good time. Yeah, I did too, and we so did, and we all did. And I also turned on my cell phone. <laughs> oh no, no problem. We're gonna have Tom Zink tomorrow, and we're also gonna have his uh, Edge's tag team partner Christian on Friday, and hopefully that will also be a really good show. I know tomorrow, I'm expecting tomorrow to be a really fun show with Tom Zink as well. And just want to say goodbye to everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow 